Hello and welcome to Talking Golf with Gary. This week, the dynamic Gary will introduce you to all kinds of topics pertinent to this past week. He'll give you some tidbits of information as what's coming up and take you on a tour around the world for all of the golf highlights. Back in Talking Gary. And hello and welcome to another edition of Talking Golf with Gary. Hope everybody had a good week out there. Uh, I know I did. Weather got a little bit warmer this weekend uh, here in the Northeast, and that's nothing but good news as far as I'm concerned. But I I didn't get out. I'm still uh, trying to take some weight off, and uh, I got a bad knee, and uh, working on that a little bit, but we'll get there hopefully by the spring and be out on the golf course, and maybe we can take you out a little bit with us, so uh, look forward to that. But let's take a look at the recap of uh, this week's tournament. The uh, We'll start with the PGA Tour, and uh, Ricky Fowler looked like he was throwing away the tournament, had a uh, five-stroke lead at one point, um, but he faulted, faulted badly, or was it that the gods of golf were taking it away from him, ripping victory from his hands? But um, he had a bizarre happening on the 11th hole and uh, really almost wiped him out completely, but he managed to rally. Um, he's had a lot of bad luck on his court. He seems cursed at time playing there, but... He survived a shocking calamity, the likes of which no one could remember, to make clutch birdies on 15 and 17 to go out in a final round 74 and beat Brandon Grace 69, who shot a 69 by two. Justin Thomas, Fowler's roommate and friend for the week, well, his friend, he was his roommate for the week, shot 72 to finish third. Uh, the saga began when Fowler's approach to the 483-yard hole came up short, number 11. He got too aggressive with his third, which skidded through the rain-soaked green, trickled down the hill behind it, and tumbled in the pond. The ball like looked like it was on ice, Fowler said. The shot was overdone, but slightly unlike Lucky. Had the ball veered just a touch to the right, it would have caught the sand from where he might have gotten up and down for bogey. Fowler took a drop at Water's Edge and walked up to look at the hill to look walked up the hill to look at the green. Then, as he says on one of his TV commercials, things got weird. With the rain intensifying and Fowler having turned his back, the ball that was at rest rolled down the hill and into the water. After this discussion with Slugger Wright, the PGA Tour Vice President of Rules and Competition. It was determined that Fowler would be penalized one more shot for the ball going in the water. He hadn't hit it there, but it had been in play. He dropped again, chipped his sixth shot onto the green, and rolled in a 17-foot putt for seven, or what he later called a really good triple. Grace birdied the 13th hole, Fowler bogeyed the 12th, and just like that, he'd gone from five ahead to one behind in less than an hour. This time, though, Fowler played to win instead of not to lose. He reached the green at two at the par 5 15th, his second shot from 239 yards, clearing the hazard and leaving him with an easy two-putt birdie from 50 feet. He was tied with Grace, who was beginning to falter ahead of him. Fowler saved par from just right of the 16th green. He drove the green on 17. And uh, he needed only two putts for another birdie. He was back to 17 under and two ahead of Grace, who bogeyed 17. Grace went into the water on 17, uh, got out and got a bogey. But Fowler hung on, and in breaking a two-year wind drought, he moved to seventh in the FedEx Cup. He qualified for the Century Tournament of Champions and bucked a trend that had seen him convert only one of his last 54 hole leads and co-leads to victory on the tour. So Ricky Fowler comes away with the uh, Waste Management Tournament victory. And uh, it, that may be a big win for him because it'll give him the confidence to know that he can overcome adversity and come from behind 
and uh, and win a tournament. And watch him in the majors because he's always there, and then seems to fade. But maybe this time, maybe this will be the year. I think this is going to be the year that Ricky Fowler wins a major. Which one? I'm not sure. But I think it's going to be uh, the his year. It'd be nice to see him win it out here in Long Island at the uh, PGA. But we'll see. Could be the Masters. Which is coming up. Before you know it, it'll be here. Dustin Johnson overcame a world-class field to win the inaugural Saudi International powered by SBIA by two strokes on Sunday and claim his sixth European Tour title. World number three Johnson came out on top in a captivating final round battle with playing partner Ho Tong Lee on day four, mixing five birdies with two bogeys in his closing 67 to finish the week at 19 under par. China's uh, Lee finished alone in second after nervously holding his five-foot birdie putt at the 18th to get to 17 under. Englishman Thomas Lewis was another stroke back after carding seven birdies and two bogeys in his final round 65, one ahead of Min Wu Lee in fourth. Johnson drew first blood in his fourth round showdown with Lee, holding from six feet to pick up a shot at the second for the fourth day in a row. Lee hit back, knocking in from close range at the long par four, uh, the fourth hole, before taking the lead when he holed his approach from high above the ninth hole to secure an unlikely birdie. After both men had surrendered a bogey on the tenth, Johnson made back-to-back -back birdies on the 11th and 12th to edge in front, and his position at the top of the leaderboard looked even more secure when Lee dropped shots on the 13th and 14th to fall three shots off the pace. But Lee sent his approach at the 15th to within two feet of the cup before rolling in for a birdie to close the gap. But it was not to be as... Uh, Dustin Johnson tapped in for a birdie at the uh, 17th to restore his two-shot advantage with one hole left to play and took the championship home. So Dustin Johnson wins. Uh, Bryson DeChambeau was also playing in that tournament. But uh, Dustin Johnson wins the Saudi International on the European Tour. So two Americans again. Winning on uh, both tours, the PGA and the uh, European Tour. Uh, they'll be coming home soon, I guess, to play some events here. But some of those events over there are very, very lucrative. They do get an appearance fee last time I looked. And uh, that's why a lot of them go over there. And plus, it's it's nice to play in different parts of the world and different uh courses and different combinations different traditions different cultures uh it is a worldwide sport now so uh good to see both guys playing in other arenas all right uh let's take a break right here we got a great interview today it's it's a little short than normal but a great interview and we'll be back right after this baseball and bbq your place for interesting baseball talk, opinions, and history. Baseball and BBQ, your place for barbecue recipes, tips, and interviews from the world of barbecue. If you like baseball and if you like barbecue, then tune in to Baseball and BBQ. Find us on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and BaseballTalkRadio.com. Please welcome in two-time U.S. Open champion, Retief Goosen. Uh, welcome to Talking Golf with Gary. Thank you very much. Yes, good to be part of it. And congratulations on your induction into the Hall of Fame. Yeah, thank you. Great honor to be um, with uh, with all these people that's uh, done great things for the game. And um, before we get into your career more, how did you get started in the game of golf? My, for, my dad was a, a pretty good golfer in his younger days. He's probably down close to a scratch handicap player. And uh, I have two older brothers that played a bit of golf too, so there was always golf clubs lying around the house, and and really that's uh, where I picked it up. Once I started caddying for them a little bit and showing a bit of interest uh, 
in a game and suddenly yeah my game really picked up from around the age of eight and uh, of course uh, you progressed and uh, made it to the uh, pro tours and you played on a, a couple of pro tours what was that like when you played your first event on on a pro tour yes um Actually, my my first event I played as uh, in a in a pro pro event was when I was an amateur when I was mm -hmm. eighteen, mm -hmm. and uh, the, that year I just won the South African Amateur Championship, so I knew my game was good, and that's how I managed to get an invite into this small uh, event and ended up winning it by three shots. <laughs> so that was like a sort of a bit of a. You know what? I can I can play with these guys, and uh, I could beat the, some of the best. And um, and I did my two year military service straight after that. When I came out of school, and I turned pro when I was twenty one, and and the rest is history, as they say. <laughs> and in two thousand and one, you win the uh, U.S. Open at Southern Hills in a playoff. Take us through that week uh, a bit. What was the feeling? How were you playing at the time? How did you feel you were playing at the time? And, um, you know, what was yeah. the pressure like in the U.S. Open? Well, I <clears throat> the week before I played uh, the English Open, and uh, I was hitting the ball really well, but I was just not making any putts. And uh, I flew over that week, and I arrived at, uh, at uh, Southern Hills, and... Um, uh, I was very lucky in the first practice round. I got a practice round in with uh, Nick Price that um, won there at uh, the PGA. And uh, so it was great to play with Nick, you know, that's one around the course and sort of see the shots and see the clubs he was hitting. Um, I think that gave me a, a bit of a boost. And uh, suddenly that week, um, my putter got hot and uh, I made everything except, obviously, on the seventh, 72nd hole. <laughs> But uh, uh, it was a uh, it was a great week on um, on the greens for me, and and obviously I love the golf course. Now in, in two thousand and four, you you come out here. I'm on Long Island, New York, and and this is where mm -hmm. you won your second Open at Shinnecock um, yeah. on a very very difficult golf course, and you battled Phil Mickelson. Tell us what that was like battling Phil Mickelson and and the crowds as well. Yeah, I think the crowd was the harder thing to battle than <laughs> Phil. Um, <laughs> uh, those, those New Yorkers know how to uh, wind you up a little bit, that's for sure. But uh, no, I, I was proud of that win, not necessarily just winning um, or beating Phil. Um, uh, with myself, in the way I coped with uh, the pressure and and uh, what was going on outside the ropes, there was, there was a lot of... Um, things said from outside the rope to try and intimidate you and a few times my caddy said to me did you hear what that guy just said i said no what, what, what did he say he said well don't worry so uh, um I, uh, I i handled my my focusing was uh, really uh, spot on to block everything out and and you've played with a, a lot of these uh uh the greats of the game uh, at one time was the Big Five. It was uh, yourself, Ernie Els, VJ Singh, Tiger Woods, and Phil Mickelson. You've played yeah. a num number of times with with Tiger Woods and his crazy uh, galleries. T tell us a little bit about playing with Tiger and the rest of those guys. Yeah, that's that's, that's always the hard part. Playing with Tiger is is really the, the gallery that goes with it and the noise. Um, it wasn't easy to. to uh, block it out and uh, you know he sometimes used the crowd to his advantage too to 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 try and uh, put you put you out a little bit but um, that's just all part of the game and part of the learning experience and a couple of times I managed to beat him and uh, in the President's Cup too so it was um, it was a good deal you know uh, mm -hmm. uh, only myself VJ and uh, Phil and Tiger it was it was a great run there we had um, for quite some time. They the big five, and there's so many great golfers that come out of South Africa. Uh, why do you think that is? I mean, uh, you got Gary Player and Ernie Els and yourself and and uh, many others. Uh, why do yeah, you? Yeah, I mean, uh, Charles Schwartzel's playing mm -hmm. well, uh, although he's been 
struggling a little bit. Louis Louis Vistosen is playing really well. Um, uh, a couple of other young guys, Brandon Stone, coming out there. Um, yeah, there, there's a lot of really good uh, in Africa now. Um, it's just for them to find sponsorships to come abroad. It's it's very expensive uh, with the economy in South Africa. It's not easy to travel and uh, for them to find the money to come and play abroad. So hopefully we'll see a few more. Uh, young players coming out soon. Now, you did a lot of traveling in your career. You played on the European Tour, the PGA Tour, and uh, did, how did the travel affect your playing at all? Well, I think I became used to it. Um, I, I was a world player, so was Ernie. Um, we played everywhere. Um, <laughs> the one year I played 38, 39 tournaments worldwide, and wow. Yeah, probably you know twenty of those were internationally, and about eighteen on on the on the tour here. So it, it uh, I don't know. I I I sort of enjoyed the traveling and the different cultures and 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 playing playing around the world and building a brand for you around the world. Was there any uh, tournament, especially a major, that you felt that you? Um should have won, and you just, uh, whatever happened, you did not win it? Mm, well, um, obviously, playing on a European tour first, the British Open was always a, a tournament uh, that I felt I could win, and I've had my chances quite a few times. I don't know how many times I've finished in the top 10 there, yeah, uh, yeah. but I just couldn't put the four rounds together to to pull it off. Um I would have loved to have won the British Open, um, and the Masters is obviously a, a, a obviously another great event to win. Mm-hmm. But uh, the British Open is one I would have liked to have won. What What is it like uh, going to the Masters for the first time? Yeah, it, it's a it's a rather weird uh, <laughs> sort of feeling, you know, yeah. because you drive outside the gates and it's just people everywhere, and you know restaurants and blah blah there's nothing really like what you sort of imagine and then when you drive through the through the gate it's just like suddenly you're in a different country and a different <laughs> world uh, yeah no it, it it was uh uh you know for all the years i when i grew up the only events they showed on tv was the masters and the british open mm-hmm. and uh yeah to finally actually walk the course and see how slopey it is and yeah. see how it, it it just was uh mind boggling yeah yeah we don't get that on television we don't get the feel of the <laughs> slope and the hills and everything but it it is yeah. uh it is uh, such a majestic looking course and uh you know even uh, the announcing and everything is so much different than your regular golf tournament yeah it just doesn't feel like you actually in america playing um, you know, who knows where you could be playing that mm-hmm. event, but uh, it is, uh, yeah, it is uh, one of a kind. Uh, now, you turned 50 in a, a couple of, uh, well, about a week or so, oh. I think. Yeah, Sunday. Okay, congrats. Happy birthday. Um, Thank you. Will we be seeing you on the Champions Tour at all over here in the States? Yeah, definitely. I'm starting next week in Boca Raton and, and then off to Naples. So, yeah. I see no reason to be the youngster on tour again and go out there and have a bit of fun with guys. I, 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 I know, you know, a long time that he's a little older than me. So, uh, yeah, I'm very much looking forward to playing a bit out there. Well, that's terrific. And uh, I know you're short on time and I appreciate the time, but I wanted to uh, congratulations uh, again on making Thank the you. Hall of Fame and we'll look for you on the Champions Tour. Yeah, looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Retief. Thanks. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. Sponsor an ad on the podcast. Support our show and let people know about your business. Email us today. Now it's time to do the calendar. Now it's time to do the calendar. Oh, hooray, let's sing the calendar. Now it's time to do the calendar. It is time to do the calendar for this week. And let's see, we've got an interesting uh, situation coming up, but uh, 
The uh, PGA Tour will be in California to play the AT&T Pebble Beach Pro-Am. Ted Potter Jr. is the defending champion in that one. The Champions Tour back in action. Yes, sir. They're playing in Boca Raton, Florida, and they're playing the Oasis Championship. Mark Kalkovecchia defends at that title. Now, we have an interesting thing on the European Tour. The European Tour and the LPGA are playing the same tournament on the same courses, and that is called the ISPS Handa, H-A-N-D-A, Vic Open. It is the only professional tournament in the world that sees players from both the men's and women's tours play on the same golf course at the same time for equal prize money. Stars from the European Tour and the LPGA Tour have teamed up with the ISPS Handa PAG Tour of Australasia and the ALPG Tour to offer fans a unique and innovative tournament. The male and female tournaments run concurrently, meaning they won't necessarily compete directly against each other, but will play in alternating men's and women's groups and will play for a purse of $3 million split equally the beach and creek courses at the 13th beach golf club will host the four tours for the first two days with a 36 hole cut seeing players progress to a weekend on the beach course there is then another cut after the third round before two champions are crowned at the close close of play on sunday the tournament was first introduced 1957 on the men's Australian golfing circuit, but it was 2012 when the event took on a much greater significance by breaking new ground and running the Women's Victorian Open at the same time at the same venue. Seven years later, and the event is arguably stronger with the European Tour and the LPGA Tour on board. So, uh, interesting thing. They're going to run two together, um, the LPGA and the European Tour. Actually, four, because they're going to have the PGA Tour of Australasia and the LPG, ALPG Tour, <sighs> the Asian Ladies Golf Tour, to offer fans a unique and innovative tournament, something completely different. And Minji Lee won it last year. Uh, it was called the Oats uh, Vic Open last year, and now the ISPS Handa uh, is sponsoring it this year. So, a unique tournament, and uh, it's going to be confusing, but we'll give you a wrap-up for it uh, on next week's show. So, be sure to, to tune in for that one. And... Uh, wasn't it great to talk to Retief Goosen? Uh, just got a lucky break, was able to get him on the uh, publicity tour um, that they're on the uh, inductees. This year's inductees into the World Golf Hall of Fame will be, uh, um, I think she's deceased, Peg Kirk Bell, I think her name is. Uh, Jan Stevenson, the LPGA star and legend player. Um, uh, Retief Goosen. Um, um, Billy Payne, the uh, chairman of the Masters for, for so many years, and Dennis Walters, who uh, people on YouTube golfers know Dennis Walters because he's got a, a number of YouTube videos. He's a handicap uh, disabled golfer who uh, gives expedi ex expeditions, exhibitions all over the world and uh, has been for 40 some odd years. And uh, has worked with all of the greats, Nicholas Palma, Tiger. He, he, he's just been with everybody and makes a great contribution to the game. Um, and is a great inspiration to millions of people across the golfing world. So um, uh, Dennis Walt is uh, well-deserved getting into uh, the Hall of Fame, the World Golf Hall of Fame on a Lifetime Achievement. And uh, 
trying to get him on the show too. So we'll have two Hall of Fame inductees, maybe maybe more. We're trying to get more as we go along. Sometimes it's tough trying to arrange with their schedules, but we're working on it, folks. So uh, let's see what happens with that. Well, that's going to wrap it up for this week's show. I hope you enjoyed it, and I want to thank my guest Retief Goosen and Brittany Wynn of the World Golf Hall of Fame for arranging it, and I want to thank you all for listening. And don't forget to subscribe on iTunes, YouTube, Google Play, or wherever you listen or watch the podcast. Hit the subscribe button. That helps me grow the show and expand to new listeners. And that's going to do it. So until next time, remember, as you walk down a fairway of life, you must smell the roses before you only get to play one. Good night, everybody. Have a great week. I'll see you next time on Talking Golf with Gary.